Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for attending. Before we get started today, I wanted to go over just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, everybody on the line is muted, but we welcome any questions you might have. So please just write them into the question pane, and then at the end of the webinar, we'll answer your questions, as many as we can get to. So feel free to ask any questions that you have. Another housekeeping note is at the end of the webinar, we'll also have a drawing for a Toomey travel tote. So be sure to stay on the line until the end of the webinar and your name will be entered in the drawing to win. So with no more further ado, let's present um, Rich and Ellen, who will be telling you about Asia's subtropical isles. Rich and Ellen? Yeah, great. Thanks, Adrian. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today. I'm Ellen McElvain. I'm an expedition advisor for Zagram, and I uh, actually recognize several of the names of attendees, so, so any of you that I've met on board, thank you so much for checking in with us today. And um, I'll go ahead and show you who we are. <laughs> okay, and then if we haven't met yet, I look forward to meeting you on board at some point. Here's our photo. This is Rich and I in Japan. <laughs> so uh, clearly we have a lot of fun. Um, I've actually been fortunate to travel on more than 20 expeditions with Zagram, and this region that we're going to talk about today is really high on my list of favorite experiences. Um, and as Adrian mentioned, also with us is Rich Pagin, everyone's favorite naturalist and biologist. Hey. So Rich is an expedition leader for us. Uh, he also travels on board several of our expeditions each year as a lecturer. So we grabbed him into the office for a day to join us on this webinar. Hi, Ellen. Um, I also help get uh, jammed soda sodas out of machines in Japan, in case you're wondering what's going on. <laughs> okay. Which does happen from time to time. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> so uh, we're both really excited about this itinerary that travels from the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines is somewhere that I think we both would say is one of the friendliest places on Earth. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. And in fact, first time I went to the Philippines, I remember leaving thinking, if ever anybody was down on humanity, you have to travel to the Philippines because the people are some of the warmest and most welcoming in the world. And I'm excited about this trip because we're doing a transect from south to north, as you can see on the map there. And it'll be interesting both culturally and as a biologist and naturalist, I'm particularly excited to see how um, the coral reef diversity changes, how the, the wildlife changes as, as we go north. And then we finish in Japan, which is one of my favorite places to travel to. And I think you know, culturally, the first time I was there, I remember thinking, this place is weird, but in a good way, where you're looking at things and they're not exactly the way you would do them, but they are um, done in a way that actually makes makes sense. I'm very excited to get back there. Yeah, I, I think, uh, just a note, my on the recent trip that Rich and I were both on in Japan, my takeaway from Japan was, this is the most different, very well-developed country in the world from where we are from. So it's, it's a wonderful standard of living, it's wonderful, it's a wonderful place to visit, and oh my gosh, it is so different in a wonderful way. So you can see the basic map of our itinerary here. Um, this itinerary will enjoy beaches, we'll explore caves, primeval forests, uh, the subtropical islands of the Philippines, Taiwan, and Japan. They're really the perfect playground for exploring by expedition ship. So let's get into a few highlights here. So there's remote, hard to reach islands. Like I said, you can really reach them the best by ship with a fleet of zodiacs. Great mix of nature and culture. And as we get into some of the stops, you'll see that um, maybe one day it's majorly a national park or experiencing nature. And then the next day there's a wonderful cultural experience or perhaps we'll have both on, on one day. It's a really good balance. Um, this itinerary is exclusive to Zagram. This is actually the first time that we've done it. We're excited to have an amazing team with us. Um, it's a really good trip for people who have been to Asia, well-traveled people who want to do something a little bit off the beaten path, do it a little bit differently. Um, there's a wonderful opportunity for whale watching in southern Japan is a huge highlight. We'll be snorkeling, we'll be scuba diving, and along, as Rich said, this transect of different cultures and environments, we'll get to see three different countries, which even within each of those countries, we'll get to see the diversity throughout each. So let's get into the itinerary here. Uh, we'll start in the Hundred Islands National Park in the north of the Philippines. So after we leave Manila, we head, head north to, uh, to this park, which is a beautiful place to get uh, a 
look underwater. And a big part of this trip is going to be to uh, have the opportunity to get out to some remote beaches, get underwater, see some of the, um, the fish and other wildlife. So um, the reason the Philippines is kind of a big deal is it is part of the Coral Triangle, which is a, a term for a, an area that uh, has very high diversity of reef building corals. And, and the Philippines is actually in that Coral Triangle. Um, 100 Islands National Park is about 124 islands that were formed as coral reefs when sea level was higher. They kind of look like mushrooms now. Many of them, they've been eroded on the sides by the sea. And we're going to spend a lot of our time looking underwater for um, different types of wildlife. And some of the things we might encounter there besides these beautiful fish, sea turtles, um, even banded sea crates, which is a type of sea snake we might, we might find there. Uh, and uh, we expect to find some of the more intact fish communities in the Philippines because it's quite a, a remote spot. And one of my favorite things about getting in the water, especially in this area of high diversity, is you never know what we're gonna uh, what we're gonna see. So I'm very excited for this stop. It's come to larger projects too, uh, dolphins, and we're, we're excited about that. All right. So from there, we'll move to uh, Fikan City in the Philippines. So we'll have this wonderful day. Start off our expedition with water sports in the national park, um, and then we'll head to this city, which is actually. Um, known for its Spanish influence. So this city is on the same island as Manila. It's the island of Luzon, which uh, is one of the larger two islands, or one of the two largest islands in the Filipino archipelago. Uh, the Philippines actually in the country has over 7,100 islands. So it's really the perfect place to explore by ship. There's, there's no better way to see a lot of it. Um, and so, but we are still on this, this large island that Manila is on. And Vigan City is, we're going there because of the well-preserved Spanish Asian architecture. Um, and it has this really rich history and it also is known for really great handicrafts. So it's very picturesque. There's cobblestone streets, there's a beautiful malecon along the waterfront. We'll see rustic mansions and Spanish churches. Uh, we'll, we'll also get to see some of the handicrafts being made. We'll visit with local weavers and potters. So it's a really nice cultural day. Uh, we can wander through the art and shopping district. So you can kind of make your own of this day if you want to wander around on your own a little bit. You can stick with our expert guides who will tell you more about a little bit later. Um, this photo here that we're looking at is the beautiful Spanish colonial church. So it's a really full day. And when we leave, we'll have a much better understanding of the Spanish influence in the Philippines, um, which is a great thing to understand right away. So next, we go to the Babuyan Island. Specifically, we're going to an island called Kalayan. Uh, and this is part of the Ring of Fire. Um, so we're heading north along some of these vol volcanic islands uh, that stretch up to Taiwan, up to Japan, and all the way around uh, the Pacific Basin. About 90% of the world's earthquakes and 80% of the largest earthquakes that have ever occurred occurred around this Ring of Fire. So quite an important geologic place. Um, Kalayan is a, an interesting place for a number of reasons. It was occupied by both the Americans and the Japanese during World War II, but um, as a naturalist, I'm quite excited to try and get a glimpse of the very rare Kalayan rail, which is a species that was not known to science before 2004. Uh, it was discovered then. There's only about 200 pairs oh, wow. estimated in the world, and it's restricted to this one island. It's a flightless rail. And some of you probably know the story of the Guam rail and some of the other rails that are found on these Pacific islands. Many of them are now extinct uh, as the Polynesians were moving around the Pacific and brought rats and dogs and pigs and such uh, with them. A lot of these birds have gone extinct. And in Guam, there was a rail that uh, about 70,000 of them before the 1960s when unfortunately uh, uh, the brown tree snake was accidentally um, transported probably in the landing gear of an airplane from Papua New Guinea and pretty much ate, uh, ate the rails away so but here in Kalayan the rails are still in existence um, and we hope to get ashore and, and maybe get a glimpse of this rare bird. Great. Okay well so we'll move on from there to Baton Island. Um, so now we're in the little island in the north of the Philippine archipelago and we'll have this opportunity to visit with the kind people who live in these small villages and that that's really how so many people in the Philippines live there. So many people that live there, you know, as I said, over 7,000 islands, and so many of them are inhabited. It's really amazing. Um, so we'll have this great visit uh, on the island of Batanes. It's a really full day. We'll, we'll meet villagers. We'll experience, uh, get to meet them in their little fishing village. And we'll see their way of life. This island itself also has a really interesting history with World War II. 
So there's a radar station that we can climb and that has amazing views, 360 degree views of the island. Um, there is also a tunnel that was used by the Japanese. <clears throat> Should we add a note? Yeah. Oh. Okay, are we? Okay, I think we're back. Sorry, everyone, we lost a little bit of internet there, troubleshooting, but I think we're back. So, you didn't miss much. We're still talking about Thoughton <laughs> Islands. <laughs> um, so, as I was mentioning, there is a tunnel that was used by the Japanese in World War II, and we will have an opportunity to go down into it. So it's one of the remaining tunnels that you can actually go inside, and we'll take um, a tour in. The tour takes about 45 minutes. Of course, you don't have to do it if you don't want to go in, um, but it, it really is quite interesting. Um, and, so, and then there's one other thing that I'm really looking forward to on this stop, which is the, um, our friends in the Philippines who are helping us plan this, they said, you have to have this honesty experience. And what it is, is this little cafe, it's called the Honesty Cafe, and it's run by an elderly couple, and they go in in the morning and stock their cafe with cookies and coffee and everything that you could want um, for the weary traveler, and uh, it's all at the honesty system. And so you go in and you pay the price and you put it in, and it's just, it's a really, um, it's just a really sweet experience, and I think that um, that's an example of what makes the Philippines such a special place to visit. The, the people, as Rich and I have both mentioned, they're just the most hospitable people in any country that I visited. I can't say enough about what just a kind and happy experience it is to go to this place. Um, and I, I should mention, too, that our crew on board the Caledonian Sky, which is the ship we'll be on, we'll show you in a little bit, um, there are good friends, and they are mostly Filipino, so it's an added special bonus to go with them. Um, they're so proud to show us where they come from, because so often we're traveling all over together. Um, so, so this is our last stop in the Philippines, and then we head for Taiwan. All right, so cheers to Taiwan. We are going to be heading to a national park on the east side. The east side is quite rugged. Um, and uh, has been protected from a lot of the industrialization and urbanization that's happened on other parts of the island. So our day here, we're going to be exploring Taroko National Park, um, which is largely unspoiled, um, beautiful nature, and the geology is fascinating as well. It's named for the Taroko Gorge, which is cut uh, um, by um, the Liwu River. And this gorge is, the rock is mostly marble, and that's why it's also called the Marble Gorge. So we'll spend the day exploring uh, this, this area. Um, some of the wildlife that we might see, there is uh, actually a subspecies of um, a bear that occurs there, also the rock macaque type of monkey, and then many, many species of birds. About 80% of Taiwan's animal species can be found in this one single park. And then as far as um, uh, human uh, goings on, on the, in this park... Human goings on. How do I say that? Um, there's a really kind of interesting and kind of frightening highway that was built, completed in 1960, goes from Taipei, it's called the Central Cross Island Highway. Uh, it's one of the most dangerous roads in the world, don't worry, we're not going to be driving it, but uh, it's extremely scenic and we're going to be looking at some parts of it, including a stop at what's called the Eternal Spring Shrine, which is up on a hill. Uh, evidently at least 226 workers were killed building in, in the construction of this highway, so it's a shrine uh, to them. We'll wow. also go see the the tunnels of nine turns, which is quite a sketchy part of the road where um, parts of it are tunnel and parts of it are open on the side so you can actually see how steep it is. So it'll be a really interesting introduction to Taiwan and it'll be a great comparison of uh, the bird species and the plant species compared to what we saw down in the Philippines. Wow, great. <clears throat> so then we're in Taipei. Um, so when we were looking at this trip, we realized, well, Several people have been to Japan, far fewer have been to Taiwan. I think I, I've probably flown through the Taipei airport myself, maybe half a dozen times, but I've never actually been there. So we're going. There's a lot of really amazing things to see in Taipei. Uh, we'll visit the Martyr Shrine. Uh, we'll see the Changing of the Guards, the National Palace Museum, which actually has the largest collection of Chinese art in Asia. So it's not in China, it's in 
Taipei. Uh, we'll go to the Taipei 101, which is the tallest building in all of Asia. So we're actually getting a city tour today. Um, you know, when you look at the iconic skyline of Taipei, you'll now know what you're looking at. And there's also a great street food component to the city tour. So if city tours are not your thing, that's okay. You have an option. So, or maybe you've been to Taipei before. Um, we also have a geology option this day. So as Rich had mentioned, the geology as we're moving up is really, really fascinating. Um, and we are bringing a geologist with us. Um, to help explain explain everything. So you can opt to go to Yelyu Geological Park. Um, and so this is a really fascinating place where millions of years of sea erosion have molded coastal bedrock into these beautiful formations all along the Cape. Um, and then there's also an option here to, or a second stop to the Gold <coughs> Ecology Park. So this is a former town that was a major gold mine um, in all of this region in Asia. And now, you know, it was a very prosperous hub for gold mining. Um, and now it's a really interesting place to visit. It's a small village at this time. So you can either go to the city of Taipei and eat street food, or you can go on the geology tour. Up to you. Super. Super. So Ellen, we have to raise our glasses. We're drinking um, green tea and we're about to enter Japan now. And I will oh. point out that I... <laughs> I don't actually live in Seattle. I live in Minneapolis, and I'm just here for these special events here. And I didn't know how to get the hot water to work, so we're drinking cold green tea, but it tastes, <laughs> it tastes, it tastes delicious nonetheless. Anyway, so we arrive in Japan, a very different part of Japan than than uh, many people have been to. It's very subtropical at this point. Uh, we're in the o uh, Okinawa Prefecture, far to the south, and the um, Ye Yeyama Islands are actually the southern and most westernmost inhabited islands in Japan and much, much closer to Taiwan than the Japanese mainland. So we're going to do a number of things here. We're going to get out in canoes and uh, check out the Miara River, which goes through some mangrove forest you can see in this picture. Um, and mangroves I find fascinating. Uh, these plants are some of the hardiest in the world. They have salt water to deal with. Other times when the tide is, uh, uh, it's, uh, is out, the water can become quite fresh. They can dry up completely and they've got to deal with uh, all these kind of difficult conditions. And when we're out looking, especially at low tide, we have a chance of seeing fiddler crabs and one of my favorite fish, Ellen, what's that? Mudskippers? Yes, yes, exactly. So mudskippers are these wonderful fish that um, uh, instead of staying in the water when the tide goes out, they're up on the mud, they're feeding on algae on the mud. Um, really fun to watch um, and just really interesting to see and to imagine how, uh, how life kind of evolved going on to land. Here's these fish that's been plenty of their time up out of the water. We also will go into a limestone cave system to explore and uh, spend some time looking at the, the reefs around the, the island as well. And then um, for those of you interested in, um, in fabrics and craft, there's a, a type of um, fabric cotton cloth called a minsa, uh, which is, is known from this area. And it's actually originated in Afghanistan and was brought through China to um, to the southern Japanese islands probably as early as the 16th century, so that'll be cool to see as well. So I'm looking forward to this. Great. And onward to the Kurama Islands. Um, so this is just another day of exploring these lush South Japanese islands, um, really places that most people don't get to. So we'll have um, a walking tour of this island. We have a short hike to an observation center at Mount Takatsuki. Um, they have a, a nice, what they themselves are described as a humble peace pagoda, um, which is just this very, very beautiful shrine, one of the many shrines that we'll see in Japan. Um, and But another real huge highlight of this day is now we're in humpback whale territory region. Um, and so if, actually I recommend if you're reading up on the region or the trip or considering, um, one of our naturalists that will be on board, ornithologist Mark Brazil, who actually lives in Japan, wrote a really interesting <coughs> article about his experience whale watching um, just off of this island. You can read it on our blog. Um, but yeah, this is just a beautiful day exploring the Kurama Islands. Do you want to say anything else about the whales? Uh, no, well, just maybe a reminder to everybody to bring, bring binoculars. And, and this whole trip, this is a spot where we do see humpback whales with some frequency, but the whole trip has some excellent sea time looking for, for birds and uh, and cetacean, so it'll be a good trip for that. Yeah, that's a good point. That if you, if maybe you haven't tried an expedition um, trip like this, so 
all of the fun is not just off the ship. Uh, anytime we're at sea, we're out on deck. Our naturalists are out on deck. We're out there with our binoculars and our cameras. And um, just because we're on the ship doesn't mean it's over. It's only just begun. It's only just <laughs> begun. All right. As they say. Okay. Next stop is the Amami Islands. Um, these are uh, this is a picture of the Amami jay, which is an endemic bird found only in this island island group. <clears throat> and there's actually a long history of human culture from uh, the Amami Islands. There's pottery that's been found thousands of years old. So there's a there's quite a bit of uh, history and culture to to talk about and learn about uh, in Amami as well as nature. We're going to visit a place called Amami Park, which is a museum that specializes in the history and culture. Uh, and natural history of this um, island group. We're going to visit a village that uh, specializes in silk weaving, and so they have a special type of kimono that they make here. So we'll start to see kimonos uh, even in these southern islands, but they'll be quite different than the ones that we'll see further north. Um, a lot of the art that's depicted on the kimonos here are inspired uh, by a, a gentleman named Tanaka Ison who um, lived in the uh, in the 20th century, he was a painter and was known for his flower and bird uh, paintings of the Amami Islands. So we'll see some of that. And then we're going to have some time to, to see one of the more beautiful cobble beaches in Japan, called Onahoshi. And we're also going to go for a walk in subtropical forest uh, looking for wildlife, such as the Anami, Amami J. Uh, and this forest is known for having massive tree ferns, so it'll be quite interesting to explore on foot. That's the Jay. That's beautiful. Um, and then we're going to uh, Yakushima, which is the last island kind of um, before you get to the main islands of Japan. And just a little side note about this island, uh, those, of you who, those of you interested in sea turtles, the uh, largest nesting ground for loggerhead sea turtles is on this island. And actually many of these loggerheads will go all the way across mm -hmm. the North Pacific uh, as they're spending 10, 20 years uh, becoming adult and they kind of follow the currents around and then end up back in Yakushima to breed. So that's kind of an interesting story. Um, <clears throat> this is a, quite an interesting forest here. It's an ancient forest. There's actually parts of the, uh, the World Heritage Site here, that, the Wilderness Core area, that uh, there's no record of tree cutting whatsoever. So uh, a lot of these trees are, are, are completely virgin forests, so we're going to have a chance to see that. And then a little side note, um, Yakushima has most of their power comes from hydroelectric, and um, the island has been a test site for Honda's hydrogen fuel cell vehicle research, which is just kind of a an interesting side note about the place. So we're going to spend our time exploring these forests. Um, those of you who like anime, Japanese anime movies, um, you might know Hayao uh, Miyazaki. He's one of the more famous uh, film uh, directors and, and writers. And there's a film called Princess Mononoke. And the forest of this island inspired um, the forest that he depicts in that particular movie. That's so that'll cool. be cool to see. I've seen it. Have you seen it? Yeah. <clears throat> it's very good. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be looking for macaque monkeys, the Japanese yellow cedar, which is the national tree. And some of these trees, as I say, have never been, been cut. Some of them are, are uh, over 2,500 uh, years old, so it'll be quite exciting to see. So, yeah, very good. All right. So here we are in Itsukushima. Uh, many of you, I don't know if you recognize this image here. This is the Mia, Miyajima Shrine, uh, the Shinto Shrine, and it's in the it's in the waters off of um, the island there. And so this is actually a really great day. We land by Zodiac and then we can go up onto the shore and explore the shrines. There's this beautiful little town that you can walk in and out of. Um, and if you Actually, if the tide is low, you can walk around the shrine. If the tide is high, then it's, you know, the shrine looks like it's floating on the water. It's beautiful photography. Um, there's, this is the Hall of a Thousand Tatami Mats. It's just a really beautiful place to visit. And we can go up onto the shrine on Mount Misen. Um, and then something I want to mention that is not uh, on the brochure, but I did confirm this morning, is we are visiting Hiroshima. So that will be in the morning on, on the day that we do go to Niwa Um, So we're going to go to the Peace Memorial Museum and the Peace Park uh, and see the site at Hiroshima, which is uh, it's kind of a sobering visit, obviously, but it, it is a, a really amazing place to go. It, and if you haven't been, um, I really highly recommend it. 
So we will do both Hiroshima and Iwo Jima um, at the stop. So it's a really full, amazing day. Uh, then our next stop in um, mainland Japan is Naoshima, which I went to the, for the first time this past year. You take a ferry out to it. This island is basically designated an art island. There are um, huge art installations all around. You can um, wander through a beautiful uh, setting, especially along the coast, and just look at some of these magnificent uh, uh, sculptures. There's also a whole number of museums. There's a newly um, uh, completed Chichu Art Museum, which is built into the highest part of the island. Uh, which has a lot of um, uh, impressionist work, including uh, water lilies by Claude Monet. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite museums there is a contemporary art museum. It's called Benesse House, which is a beautiful building, beautiful views of the sea, um, and also some, some wonderful art there as well. And then we go to um, one of the towns on the island, which is a beautiful, um, a beautiful town, uh, kind of traditional architecture and such. And some of those uh, houses were transformed into little gallery spaces. And by gallery spaces, I mean not like a lot of things in them. They have a single kind of installation inside each one and you get a little little map with the numbers on it and you roam around and see all these different uh, things, these different uh, art, it's called the Art House Project. So it's quite a quite an interesting island. So I'm really looking forward to getting back there. And it's quite fun to arrive by ferry. It makes it feel even more uh, magical. So looking forward to that. That's great. Okay, and now we're in Kyoto. So we actually disembark the ship and then we travel inland and we stay in Kyoto at a hotel. So, um, I mean, you're probably listening to this and you my gosh, we're doing everything and we are. So now we're in Kyoto and uh, I visited Kyoto for the first time this past year. It really surpassed my expectations. It's, I mean, it's really, really amazing. As Rich said, you'll see more people in Kimono the further that we go north in Japan and Kyoto is just absolutely incredible. Um, all the stops were really, really a joy to see. And it's a, it's a joy to see them with our Japanese guides who we haven't even mentioned yet, but they are just absolutely fantastic. Um, so we actually disembark the ship, as I said, and we stay in a hotel that's central to the town of Kyoto. And it's within walking distance of the Geisha district. So in the evenings, if you want, you can go out for dinner, you can go out for drinks, you can explore. Kyoto is a place that um, you really will want to take advantage of exploring a little bit on your own. Uh, you can see mentioned on the slide are some of the places that we go, the Temple of the Golden Pavilion. Um, we go to the Nijo Castle. We go to a sake brewery. I would say probably um, the Hall of a Thousand and One Cannons was my the, my favorite stop that we went to. I, it was absolutely amazing. Um, Rich and I hung out in Kyoto after the trip and had a great time. Do you? Yeah, I noticed Ellen didn't mention the karaoke, which we did. <laughs> but you can, you're welcome to do. It's good fun. Get your little room and <laughs> order food and bring it up. It's great. Um, yeah, I love Kyoto. It's so different than than Tokyo. It's uh, it was not bombed during World War II, which is one of the sad kind of things behind that. But it's got beautiful old architecture, um, lots of temples, and we and we go to many of these. And although some of you probably have been to Kyoto before, you'll then know there are, there's a, an endless supply of, of places to explore in Kyoto. It's very beautiful, tranquil city. Um, one of my uh, favorite places to go, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, you can read the, the first one there, the, the Pure Water Temple is beautiful. Um, one of my favorite spots up high in the in the hills, kind of looking over the city. And uh, this is a picture from there. It's very tranquil. The, the Japanese tend to not develop the hillsides and, and mountainsides because they're sacred places. So it's uh, once you get up, for, you know, just the city is right below you, go up into this pristine wilderness with which feels very spiritual it's really nice um, and then one of my favorite places that we'll go on the second day is the Fushimi Inari Shrine um, some of you have probably seen pictures of it the orange Tori gates uh, those arches and this uh, actually has probably more than 10,000 of these arches you can go for a hike up in the mountains and you're constantly walking through um, gates which are lined up only like you know, several feet apart from each other so it's amazing uh, amazing place to to walk around and so I just want to mention, as this is our, our last stop in Japan and on the trip, it'll be just great to compare how, how the culture here is to the, to the Philippines, where we started, uh, what makes Japan so amazing will be all around us, the green tea, ice cream, um, the, the amazing food, the, the, just the, the way people live their lives here and just how different it is, but yet how it makes sense. So I'm looking forward yeah. to getting back in Japan. That's actually a really good point, Rich. We haven't mentioned this, but the food... It, on this trip is really incredible, especially around Kyoto. If you if you're at all a foodie, we haven't marketed the trip in this way at all, but um, I am, and I 
I had a wonderful time in these regions. The food is absolutely fantastic. So I'd be quite happy with this. Um, so I want to tell you just a little bit about our ship, uh, our vessel, the Caledonian Sky. So she was refurbished in 2012. It is all sweets. Um, and she's really beautiful. This is actually my favorite ship that we work on. Um, it can take a capacity of 100 guests. Um, we'll, we'll have fewer than that, probably. Um, and there are 70 crew on board. It's a really beautiful ship. To give you an idea, the categories one through four cabins range between 230 and 250 square feet, all in suites. So you can see the photos here. These are very, very accurate photos. They're not, these aren't just the nice ones. This is what the ship looks like. Very beautiful. Uh, this is our, our team that we're bringing, or some of them anyway. And so uh, we'll just kind of go through and point out some of these, these folks. Um, so uh, Mike Messick, our expedition leader. Um, many of you may have sailed with Mike before, and he's just a great, uh, uh, he's the best expedition leader in the business, I would say. And he's, he's got uh, so much experience and, and, and really fun to be around. Uh, he's also one of the co-founders of the company. So if you haven't sailed with Mike before, this is a trip to do so. Yeah, and we'll have uh, Lynn Grigg, our cruise director. She's our most experienced cruise director with over 20 years and hundreds of expeditions under her belt. And Shirley Campbell is one of our culture people. Uh, she lives in Australia, originally from the United States, and uh, she's a, uh, an anthropologist, really one of those people you go ashore and she's immediately going out meeting the people and, and trying to bring to life the, the culture of the places we go. And Mark Brazil there, he's our ornithologist. We mentioned him before. He actually lives in Hokkaido in Japan. Um, that's him at Niwa Jima in that photo. He's a leading author on the natural history of Japan. He's published several of the leading wildlife guides for uh, Japan, so we'll be happy to have him there. Um, Brad Clemson is uh, from Australia. He's a marine biologist, a uh, really fun guy to be in the water with when we do these snorkel trips. We're, um, we have staff out in the water, and he's a great one to follow around. He's able to find often really interesting things to show us. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, Mike Murphy is our dive master. If you haven't met Mike, uh, you won't forget him when you do. He's just a ton of fun. Uh, he's worked as a dive master for years. There's nobody safer to dive with. And we have so many activities on this trip, so Mike will be in charge of the diving. Um, Michael Moore, also known as Mimo, he's an expedition leader on some trips. On this trip, he's going to be uh, working as a naturalist. Uh, he spent a lot of time in Papua New Guinea and uh, worked on a field guide to birds there. Uh, and just a really, really good naturalist to be out in the forest with. And there's our social anthropologist, Kathy Robinson. Um, she's an anthropologist. She specializes in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. She's uh, a professor at the Asia Pacific Research Area and the Australian National University. She's published several books herself and a, just a wonderful woman to explore with. Um, and Brent Stevenson, a Kiwi who studied gannets, the seabirds down uh, in New Zealand. And uh, he's a, a, an excellent ornithologist, a uh, really fun guy to, to be with on the trip. So he'll be, he'll be joining us for this expedition. And here's our friend Rich, who has been chatting at you all day today. <laughs> uh, Rich was educated at Notre Dame, which I just realized today. What do you say, no Notre Dame? Yeah, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> he has a master's in wildlife biology as well from the University of Missouri. And he's an all-around good guy. So if anyone has any questions, um, now would be a great time. Or you can also email them to me. Um, and I'll put my contact details up a little bit sooner, but we are going to do a little drawing for the Toomey bag. All right, we're reaching into the bucket. And the winner is Linda Bator. I probably said your name wrong, Linda, I'm sorry. <laughs> But uh, we'll let we'll get in contact with Linda, and she is the new proud owner of the Zagram Expeditions to me tote. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to put my contact details up here. If you do have questions about this itinerary or about this expedition, um, please call me. I know that my email address is long, but you can also uh, call me at the phone number listed there. So, yeah, we look forward to seeing you. Thanks for joining us.